I never knew crow could taste this good. What am I talking about? Well, last year, year and a half ago, roughly, I questioned, I just questioned whether or not Ryan Coogler was appropriate for directing the Black Panther. He had only done a couple of independent features. He did Creed and he did Fruitvale Station, both of which I liked for the most part. So, you know, given his independent cred, I just wasn't sure if he was ready to direct a big blockbuster CGI heavy film. Well, like I said, I'm happy to say he proved me wrong because we finally have a Black Panther film after I don't know how many decades, and it is on point. In my opinion, the MCU has only, out of I don't know how many, 13, 14 films, only five of those films are solidly good. They now have a sixth. I went into this movie wanting, praying that it would be good, that I would like it. Because I think this is an important film. Now, when it started off, I can, I'm gonna admit to you, I was a little worried. Uh, the first fight scene where Black Panther goes to save, I can't remember, the Nikoya, I believe her name was, the, the, the character played by Lupita Nyong'o. He goes to save her in the, in the forest or the jungles of, uh, I guess, Wakanda or outside Wakanda. It was shot with the camera really tight. It was very dark and you couldn't really see what was going on. It reminded me of the Daredevil film that Affleck starred in where all the shots were so dark and muddy. You couldn't really enjoy the action. And I felt like that's how that first scene was shot. I thought the camera was kind of boring. It was very, it was what I was afraid of where I thought we were gonna see like a, a more independent style of camera where it's very static. You know, he speaks on a shot cut to she speaks on a shot, cut back to he speaks on a shot, as opposed to maybe having a dolly or a tracking shot in between that. It was very pedestrian, the shooting at the beginning. But I don't know what happened. Once they got to South Korea, to the casino scene, I don't know if someone whispered in Kugler's ear, hey man, we got this camera, we got a crane here, and we got this stuff we can do with technology here. And I don't know what happened, but it's like, Something took over and the film just takes off like a bullet. To me, this is easily the most layered, most mature, most nuanced, most textured, most allegorical film that Marvel has put out to date. More than that, it's a film that's relatively sticks to its tone. It, it takes on a serious tone and it does not let go of that with, a, with the exception of a few jokes, which I thought were well placed. This film says, take me seriously and you know there's no tony stark delivering little uh jokey jokes every now and then this film strikes a tone and it it stays true to it throughout and i'm going to say this even though anyone of any ethnicity any race any color creed whatever anyone can come to enjoy this film this is truly a black film through and through. There are certain things that happen in this film, a certain, like I say, subtext in this film that only a person of African descent could appreciate. One of the characters, quote unquote, in this film is the nation of Wakanda, a fictional nation, mind you, but it is on the continent of Africa, a continent that has been ravaged, raped, plundered for centuries, decades, and continues to be so. So you cannot escape the political ramifications of this film. And I think that makes this film even more important. Now, I'm not trying to get on my SJW thing here, but the fact that this film still manages to be entertaining, it deserves every opportunity to speak its truth. And there's no doubt that like, uh, I saw a clip of a British presenter who got in trouble for saying this. It is a remarkable film. It's very different, the film that you're, you're both in because you go in the cinema and it is overwhelmingly a black cast. Uh... I wasn't mad, but, cause it's true. This is an overwhelmingly black cast. On a purely entertainment level, this film works amazingly. I don't think there's anyone who's miscast in this film, not that I can recall off the top of my head. Everyone does a fantastic job. Obviously, Chadwick does a great job. Deny Garara, I don't know, Garara, please forgive me. 
amazing job. Letitia Wright, phenomenal. Andy Serkis, he brings some of that humor and he's, he's amazing. I'm amazed that they got rid of his character so quickly. I thought that character still had a lot more things that were interesting about that character that I would have liked to have seen, but okay, they did what they had to do. I'm not that mad at them. The action is, is amazing. Like I said, the South Korean uh, fight scene, uh, the camera moves around very similar to the, the church scene in Kingsman, the first Kingsman movie. It's a, it's a technique that we've seen done many, many times, but hey, I wanna say, I'm seeing it now in a film with a majorly black cast. And I'm, I, I have no shame in saying that. Moving on from South Korea, the set pieces and action sequences just get bigger and better. Uh, the last half of this film, it's on some Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings type of stuff. And even the secondary characters in this movie are entertaining. I already mentioned Claw. You also had the character M'Baku, who was a, a, a warring chieftain from another tribe uh, who goes against the Black Panther, challenges him to the throne. Martin Freeman as Everett Ross. I've liked Martin Freeman ever since I saw him back in, I don't know, 2002 in uh, the BBC's office. Angela Bassett, Daniel Kalua. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. And there's a cameo by Sterling K. Brown, who just amazing. I think he's in a couple scenes. I think he's in one flashback scene, but then he's in a, a scene that takes place at the beginning of the film in the, um, I don't know, in the, late 70s or something like that. He owns the screen in his little amount of time he's on the screen. Forrest Whitaker, he doesn't have a lot to do, but what he does is amazing. And kudos to the casting director. They managed to find an actor. I'm, I think he was in The Wire, I'm not sure, but they found an actor who, I don't know if it's through CGI, but had the same kind of lazy eye as Forrest. I mean, all, hey, I'm not trying to throw shade. I'm just trying to say everybody was firing on all pistons in this film. There's so many levels to this film. I mean, I don't even know where to start. I mean, you could do like a college course on this movie alone. In some ways, I saw it as an indictment of the current political administration that's, I think, ruining this country, but that's just me. I saw shades of Trumpism in both uh, T'Challa and in Killmonger, you know, T'Challa. He believes at the beginning of the film in isolationism, nativism, nationalism, not wanting to share anything with the outside world, wanting to protect the borders of Wakanda. Wakanda is the only country in the world that's never been colonized or conquered. I mean, there's a pretty obvious connection there. Then you have Killmonger, who wants to export terrorism. I said terrorism. Whether his motives are noble or not, he wants to export terrorism. He wants to set up a dictatorship where he uplifts his people, but as we see in some of his actions, he gets caught up into a power trip. He burns fields so that no one can challenge his authority. That sounds familiar as well. Here's the difference. Both of these two brothers, even though they have some of that nature in them, you can look at T'Challa and say, well, this is a black nation that has seen what has happened to other black nations, and it is a matter of self-preservation that he wants to remain isolated. So he gets a pass. With Killmonger, again, I don't agree with his methods or what he, his, his intent, but I definitely agree with his motives. That's why they both get a pass and why I won't condemn them like I would condemn this current administration. There's also the fact that both T'Challa and Killmonger are not pasty and they are skilled and talented at what they do, unlike you know who. You are fake news. I also saw in this movie uh, a metaphor for what I consider to be, and I, I don't know if anyone will agree with me, but what I see to be the class warfare within the black community, where you have the quote unquote haves and the have nots. You have those who have succeeded in some measure or form, have some form of financial stability or success, whereas you have others who feel like they've been left behind, they're still struggling, They're, they've been left in the hood, if you will, and the, the anger at, at being left behind is, is visceral. And just as we see Killmonger as a child being left behind, I think that speaks loads to a portion of, of our black community that feels like they've been left behind just as well, with no prospects for the future, no prospects for education, employment. I mean, the list goes on and on. So like I say, this movie, there's so much depth to it that I think can only speak to a certain segment of our society. What really spoke to me was 
I, the fact that what I read out of it was, you know, no matter how many of us may have a measure of success versus how many of us are still struggling, we have to remain tribal. You know, even though we may not, some of us may not agree with how other people live their lives or we may not agree with how other people carry themselves or how they dress or how, how they speak or whatnot. We can all have that debate, but the bottom line is we cannot afford to distance ourselves from each other. We have to remain tribal. And that really spoke to me in the scene where Killmonger walks into Black Panther's court. He starts off speaking colloquial English. Then all of a sudden he breaks out into that Wakandanese or whatever you want to call it. And I was like, wow, that what that what that one scene told me was that we all can, even though we may judge each other, we all can learn from each other. Everyone has something to teach to one another. And definitely, we should not make the mistake of underestimating each other because that may come back to haunt some of us. It may come back to kick some of us in our ass, just like Killmonger came back to handle Black Panther. And handle him, he did. When Killmonger burns the fields, uh, I don't know, I, what were they, the, 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 the Panther power fields or the flowers or whatever they were called. When he burns those fields, that that was clearly, in my opinion, in my eyes, you know, shades of Detroit, LA, Watts, Ferguson. Anger at being, again, being neglected, being left behind, feeling like you've been subject to an unjust system, which Killmonger had every right to feel that way. Now, I feel personally, I think he was on a power trip because when he yoked up that older woman, I was like, nah, this cat's got to go. But again, this is why, and I'm, I'm gonna move into another topic now, without a doubt, Killmonger is the best, best, best villain ever created in the MCU. And I'll go further. Michael B. Jordan was absolutely devastating as Killmonger. I think he stole the movie from Chadwick Boseman. The first scene alone, when he's in the, in the, in the uh, museum, and he schools the European woman on the African artifacts. I was like, okay, this, this guy's got something to say, all right? And then as the movie progresses, you see him get angrier and angrier. But what made him so brilliant and what made the writing so brilliant is that they give you a justification for his anger so that even though he's yoking up old women and choking them, you kind of still understand. And at the end, I'm gonna tell you something. I don't care if y'all want to clown me or not, because I know I know some of y'all brothers out there felt the same way. But when he delivers, he delivers two speeches. Uh, there's one where he, um, well, we're spoiling here. He he's uh, stabbed, mortally wounded on the maglev train tracks. He delivers a speech there, and then they end up on uh, a, a, a hilltop overlooking the sunrise. And he deliver he delivers another speech there. Those words, if I were to read them on the page. I would say, ah, oh, this is so corny. I mean, I'm, it's a little heavy handed, isn't it? So I tip my hat to Michael B. Jordan because those words had me in tears. I was wiping tears out of my eyes. And I, hey, come on now, I know a lot of other people were too, but absolutely heartbreaking, just devastating. And I, I mean, I can't put into words how, <laughs> how amazing his performance is in this movie. If I had one negative thing to say about the film, I would say that some of the CGI was a little dodgy. Some of it is like the 2002 Spider-Man movie, the first Spider-Man film. It's not the best, but the, the fact is, is that after a certain point, after the movie kicks into high gear, I, it didn't bother me. For example, this clip right here. <laughs> I remember when this was released maybe two, three weeks ago, and I was like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> this shall not stand, this will not do. When I was sitting there in the theater, it was a little, you know, it was like, okay, that that's just not the greatest. <laughs> but I don't care. The last thing I wanna say, and I have to say, it's very difficult for me to separate my feelings for this film as an African-American citizen of this country and as someone who's reviewing this movie. 
having said that, I think most of you know that if I didn't like this movie, I wouldn't have had a problem telling you. But um, I got to say, I'm seeing a lot of things that are really make, hurting my heart. I'm seeing a lot of articles, think pieces by black people who are finding things just to criticize about this movie. I'm seeing some stuff, and if I'm talking, if, if I'm talking about you, I don't mean it harshly, but people having things to say about uh, people who are dancing in the theaters and entering the theaters on some other stuff, on other levels, you know, women being held uh, in court, uh, uh, carried into theaters. And I'm like, you know what? No one had anything to say, as far as I could tell, when people dressed as Captain America when they went to see Civil War or went to Soldier, people coming to the theaters dressed as uh, Luke, or uh, Han Solo during any Star Wars release. So can, can we have this? Unless y'all prevent me from getting to my seat with the dancing, I ain't got a problem with it. So now let's just, let's bask in this for a second. I don't care if it was produced by a white studio. I don't care if Disney did it. I don't care if Disney's getting paid. So is Ryan Coogler getting paid. So is Angela, so is Chadwick, so is Daniel, so is Letitia. So I'm good with it. We can create our own stuff and I'll go support that too. But let's just have this. And for all of these alt-right people or, or mainstream people who don't understand why, you know, we rejoice with this film and you have something to say negative about it, well, screw you because You've had your day in the sunlight. Give us this one moment, and if you, don't un if you can't understand that, this is not your movie. If you wanna criticize this movie on its artistic merits, that's fine, that's, you're entitled to that. But to be out there protesting because you think it's a political film, or you wanna compare it to the Democrats. Oh, fool, shut up, you be doing that too. Well, I guess I compared it to Trump, so I, I guess you can make that argument. But. You gotta be balanced. If you're not balanced, I, you know, you really have nothing to say to me. And for all you, all you neo-Nazi Breitbart readers, you uh, alt-right, like I mentioned before, just f you all together, okay? F you if you're saying, well, it's too black, or why do you get to have a black panther? Can we have a white panther? I'm sure people are saying that, so f you. I've said it three times now, I apologize. Uh, to the people who are listening, not to the people I'm saying f you to, or that's four times. It's a great film from an entertainment standpoint. It's a great film to deliver a political message. It's a great film to herald black cinema, even though it's a white film studio uh, uh, produced by white people. I don't care. The, the character was created by a white man. I, I really don't care. This is a black film through and through. Hopefully this is a launching pad to, that we can see much more product like this. And I'm not trying to throw Black Lightning and Luke Cage and all these other properties under the bus, but I wanna see more properties like this where Negroes are flying spaceships. Where they are superheroes, where they're fighting super villains. You know, I'm watching Black Lightning, okay? He's fighting Lala, all right? Oh, th that's all good. Luke Cage was fighting Cottonmouth in the hood. Someone shouted out, oh, he said something about your mama when Luke Cage was fighting Cottonmouth. Fine, but I'm tired of it. I need more Black Panther in my life. I need more Wakanda in my life. I need something that my son and my little brother and children all over can look at this and say, hey, we're just as good to fight Thanos. We can handle Thanos. We can handle Killmonger. We can handle Galactus. I don't know whomever. We don't have to be worrying about just fighting drug dealers. <laughs> Okay, maybe I did go a little SJW. I don't know if this is a film review or a political statement, but you know, I don't care. Take it as you will. Go see this movie. I give this movie four out of five reels. If you know me, you know I don't give four reels that lightly. This is a good film. It's one of the top films the, MC, the MCU has to date. I put it right underneath uh, Winter Soldier. And well, okay, I put it somewhere between Winter Soldier and Civil War. It's that good. Go see it. Go see it three times, four times. I'm gonna go see it for the second time this coming weekend. I'll probably go see it a third time. Go see Black Panda. Damn, let's try that again. Go see Black Panther. And that's the martini. <laughs>